Hi everyone, my name is Kim Moon. I'm a software engineer working for Pepper Data. At Pepper Data, we help people improve the performance of their big data clusters. That's our main focus. But we are also interested in exploring new big data platforms. In particular, Pepper Data and several other companies have been building a new big data stack on Kubernetes. Together, we made it possible to run Spark on Kubernetes. Now we are adding HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System, to the big data stack on Kubernetes. Spark and HDFS should work closely together. So we have to fix a few issues in how they work together on Kubernetes. So I'm going to talk about that today. Here's the outline of the talk. First, I'll do a quick introduction on Kubernetes, if such a thing is possible. And then I'll talk about how we run Spark and HDFS on Kubernetes. There's a short demo. And finally, we'll discuss some issues that we ran into. HDFS data locality was somehow broken initially, and secure HDFS support was missing. So we fixed both. I'll explain how. But first, what is Kubernetes? Uh, curious. How many of you are familiar with uh, Kubernetes? OK, wow, that's a surprisingly good number. Yay. All right, so Kubernetes is a, a new cluster management software open sourced by Google in 2014. So it manages many computers and runs many programs using those computers. In that sense, it is similar to Yarn or Mesos. What sets apart Kubernetes is that when it runs programs, it puts them in special runtime environments called Linux containers, which are also known as Dockers or Rockets, right? So containers and Dockers are very popular. So people wanted to run them not only on a single computer, but across a cluster of computers. And Kubernetes does just that. It is actually designed and built for containers based on Google's internal experience of running containers for 10 years. So they've been doing that rather secretly. So ever since this was released, a lot of people joined the project, right, and built a big community around it. Okay, that's cool. But what's the benefit of using containers? Many of us have this bad experience. My Spark job suddenly failed with the class not down exception when someone installed a new version of Spark. Or, you know, I had to change my Tomcat server port because someone else was running another Tomcat on the same host. They shouldn't touch my stuff, right, you would say. Especially, it has been working fine. I love Batman, but I'm not endorsing the violence here. There's got to be a better way, right? So, containers solve this problem fundamentally. They create more isolation layers between programs using virtualization technologies that virtual machines are based on. But unlike virtual machines, containers are still very fast because they picked a specific set of technologies that are efficient and lightweight. First, each program gets a virtual file system that contains an independent set of software packages. This is better known as Docker images, right? So this way, this other person can install new packages only on his container, right, without affecting my program at all. What if I have a server program like Tomcat? Do I need to change the port depending on who else is running Tomcat? Kubernetes also gives each program a virtual network interface that comes with a unique virtual IP address so that both my Tomcat and your Tomcat can open the same port under different IP addresses. And there are other isolation layers around separate process ID space, maximum memory, and CPU limit. You can also mount external data as volumes on your containers using various Kubernetes mechanisms, like credentials using Kubernetes secrets volume, or local storages using the host path volume. So with these virtualization technologies, Kubernetes became very popular among microservices each of which is a simple server program that provides only one service, okay? 
That's cool. So here's how a Kubernetes cluster looks. So we have multiple cluster nodes, like node A, node B. You know, there can be more. I'm showing only two for illustration purpose. Across the cluster nodes, we run multiple programs in these things called pods. So what is a pod? A pod is a unit of scheduling and isolation in Kubernetes. So a pod typically consists of two containers. The primary container runs a user program like Tomcat, and there's also an infrastructure container that holds isolation layers, like a virtual IP address, and shares that with the primary container. Okay? So here we have pod one, two, and three, and each pod may have a different Docker image, and they get unique virtual IP addresses like 10.0.0.2 of pod one here. And these virtual IP addresses look very different from the physical IP addresses of cluster nodes, like 196.0.0.5 of node A. Okay? So some of us at Pepper Data looked at Kubernetes and thought that it would be really cool if we can run big data applications like Spark also on Kubernetes. Then we found that engineers from other companies were thinking about the same thing and started this GitHub project, Apache Spark on KLS, right, that contains a fork of the upstream Spark core. Right? So we joined the project and combined our efforts. Together, we modified the source code of the Spark driver and executors. So it's possible to run Spark jobs natively on Kubernetes. And now I'm happy to report that our efforts are actually recognized by the upstream Spark community. So the proposal for changing Spark core, this SP, right, has been accepted. So we are beginning to send our code to the main Spark repo. Cool, right? And there was a related talk in this, uh, this year's Spark Summit conference. All right, so here's how it looks if you run a Spark job on Kubernetes. You would submit a job from outside the cluster using a client, right? Your driver launches in a pod, and the driver will in turn launch multiple executors across the cluster nodes. They also run in pods. And the driver and executors will get unique virtual IP addresses, and they will communicate with each other using those virtual IP addresses. And if other people run their jobs, that will create their own path. And so your job and their job can use different Docker images with possibly different Spark versions. So they will not interfere with each other. Make sense? Quick question. Sure. Yeah. So that's a good question. So uh, Kubernetes relies on uh, virtual network interfaces that the Linux provides, the Linux kernel provides. So if it's within the same node, uh, they just bypass the physical network interface, right? If they are jumping, the packages are jumping to other cluster nodes, then they go through the physical network. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that covers Spark. But Spark is for big data, so you need data most of the time. So where can Spark on Kubernetes access data? So if you're running Kubernetes on cloud, like AWS EC2, you can access cloud storages like S3, no problem there. But outside the cloud, your data is often stored on HDFS, right? So you want to access HDFS, how? There are two options, option one, we made it possible to run HDFS itself on Kubernetes with the work in this GitHub sub project, right? With this, you get the benefit of data locality optimization as well. I'll talk about it pretty soon. The other option is just to access your existing HDFS that's perhaps running together with Yarn or Mesos today. This is possible, right? You just need to specify the right HDFS address in your job configuration, right? With this, you can easily try out just the Spark on Kubernetes first with your existing HDFS data, right? But some of us have the secure HDFS, so we have recently added the secure HDFS support 
to spark on Kubernetes. I'm going to talk about this also pretty soon. Cool. So here's how we made HDFS run on Kubernetes. <coughs> HDFS has two types of daemon programs. The name node daemon runs on a central cluster node and maintains the file system metadata, like which directories have which files and where are those file data. So in Kubernetes, we launch the name node also as a par, just like everything else, right? On a single cluster node that we designated using the Kubernetes node label, like node A and the label here. And the name node part stores the metadata on the local disk using the Kubernetes host pass volume. So host pass is a way to mount specific local disk directories of the cluster nodes on your pod, okay? So the second HDFS daemon type is data nodes that actually store the file data. So we launch the data nodes also as pods across all cluster nodes. And data node pods also use the host pass volume to store the file data on local disks. So these host pass volumes are persistent. So even if you restart the name node or the data node pod, right, you don't lose data. They can access the same data after restart. Sure. Are there virtual IPs inside the name node and data node? I'm going to talk about it pretty soon. OK. Good question, though. So uh, these daemon pods are special pods, right? Daemons don't actually need a virtual pod IP addresses because there is only one instance of each type on a given cluster node. So there is no need to worry about the port collision. So we chose not to get the virtual network interface that we talked about before. Right? So these daemons are associated with the physical IP addresses of cluster nodes, like 196.0.0.5. This becomes important later when you talk about data locality. OK? All right. So without further ado, let's take a look at a demo. So I'm going to first launch the HDFS on Kubernetes. And recently, we added a secure HDFS configuration option to this guy as well. So I'm going to use that. This is a recorded demo in the interest of time. So I can just replay it here. So the whole thing happens under this public GitHub repo. So anybody has access to this. And inside this directory, there are some configurations for the name node and data nodes. And I just created a Kubernetes config map containing the Kerberos config, which will be used by the name node and data node. And I'm launching the name node pod right here. So Kubernetes supports multiple ways of launching pods for name node. I'm using this uh, staple set of size one. It's a mechanism to ensure that there's only one main node pod across the entire cluster at any time point. OK, and checking the pod, name node pod is up, HDFS name node zero. And then I'm launching the data node pods. For that, I'm using daemon set. This is a mechanism to ensure there is a one instance of this daemon pod on each and every cluster node. Kubernetes does that automatically for us. OK? So looking at the name node log, you see the data nodes daemons have already registered to the name node. Cool. Now I'm going to launch a Spark job to use this secure HDFS. OK. Initially, I did not have the Kerberos uh, credential, so I'm getting the authentication error. right? But here, I'm signing on with Kerberos using this KNE tool, typing, my, typing in my password. With that, I get something called Kerberos ticket, which we see a glimpse of here. And the same shell command, file system shell command, now works because of Kerberos, right? Slash TMP is empty. And I'm going to launch a Spark job using Spark submit command. But here's the default configuration specifying Docker images for my job. And here's the other configuration for enabling the you know, secure HTTPS option on the client side. Okay. Here we go, there's a Spark Summit command, and it's going to go on for a while. So I'm going to switch to a different terminal to check the status of the driver and executors. OK. So first to check if the driver pod is up. OK, the last pod is the driver up and running. And Spark Client just created something called Kubernetes Secret that contains this other thing uh, called HTTPS token. We're going to talk about it later. 
But OK, now executor is on the top. Looking at the driver log, going on, going on. And OK, success. The third last line, success, local world count and DFS world count, agree. OK, and looking at back the job execution, this slash TMP has my directory under you know, my account. All right, that's the short demo. OK, so we just saw the demo, and everything seems smooth. But initially, there were a couple of issues. Let's talk about them. First, data locality. So location is pretty important in general. If your daughter wants to learn Chinese, you send her to China during summer so that she can pick up language and the culture really fast over there. If your son wants to learn Japanese, then you send him to Japan, right? And this location-based learning is quite effective for languages because there is a high bandwidth interaction with local people, right? And who knows, they might have picked up some other skills. <laughs> the map is from the game. I have to do this. <laughs> so data locality is also like that. Your Spark job has many different tasks. And each task wants to process a particular slice of data called a partition. So you send the task to where those partitions are because reading data over the network is usually slow. But reading your partition data straight from local disks will be much faster. So this data locality is one of the reasons why HDFS is faster than other distributed storage systems. And Spark has source code that interact with this data locality. But this data locality layer was initially broken in Spark on Kubernetes. It was broken at many levels. We had to fix all of them. Let's talk about them. So first, node locality. When a particular cluster node has the partition of a task, you send the task to that exact node. Right? This is called node locality. Let's look at an example. So this Spark job wants to read file A and file B on HDFS. File A is on node A, file B on node B. And we have executors here. So we want the driver to be smart enough to send the task for reading file A to executor 1 on node A, where this file A is, right? And send another task for reading file B to executor 2 on node B. So that tasks will go there. They will read straight from local disks, right? But how can the driver as software right, figure this out? There is a source code inside the driver that basically checks file locations, right? Are they matching executor locations? Here, we compare file A location with executor 1 location. They're supposed to match, right? So for file A, the driver you know, will simply ask the name node which data node is in charge of file A. And the name node will say that's data node 1. And the associated IP address is that of node A. Right? Then the driver will determine this, find the IP address of the host that executor 1 is running on. And here is the problem. We get an unexpected IP address. Right? So if this were YAM or Mesos, we would get the same physical IP address of node A. But in Kubernetes, right, these executors are running in pods with unique virtual IP addresses. The driver will get this virtual IP address. Right, these virtual IP addresses will never match right, data node IP addresses. They are all physical IP addresses. So the driver would get confused and start sending tasks to wrong executors. Right? This will slow down tasks and jobs a lot. Right? So we have to fix this code. The fix itself is pretty simple. Don't stop after getting this executor pod IP address. Also ask the Kubernetes API server right? on which cluster node this pod is running. There's an API for that. Right? So then Kubernetes will say right, that's you know, node A, and you get a matching right, physical IP address. So this is how we fixed the node locality. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to simplify the storyline because uh, you know, drawing replica is kind of confusing. Yeah. Okay, but yeah. if the data node were to go down, then it has been telling 
That's right. Yeah. 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 Right. So sometimes node locality is not available, but rack locality is. What is rack? This is rack. So when you build a data center, you put tens of servers in a single rack, and then you place a network switch at, at the top of the rack that connects all the servers in the rack. So if your servers are talking to each other inside a single rack, that's pretty fast. It's not as fast as reading local disks, but still a decent speed. But if they are talking to other servers in another rack, that could be much slower depending on the traffic. So you want to avoid that, right? So here we have rack one and rack two. Rack one has node A and B, rack two has node C. And we have file A on node A and file B on this time node C. So we have these executors, but unfortunately, we don't have any executors on node A. Maybe node A didn't have enough memory or something. So we cannot get the node locality for file A, right? So the next best thing is to send the task for file A to the nearby executor one on node B in the same rack so that we can read the data at least from the same rack, right? For file B, it's a no-brainer. Just send it over there to get the node locality. So we want to read like this, right? We don't want to send file A task to executor two in this different rack because reading across this rack boundary can be much slower, okay? So the driver has another source code that compares rack locations of files with rack locations of executors, right? For file A, it's pretty much the same. We start with the same node location, this guy, IP of node A, and then we simply map the cluster node IP address to the corresponding rack ID. So there's a rack ID mapping information keyed by cluster node IP addresses. But on the executor side, right, it's broken in a similar way. We are stuck with the executor pod IP address. Right, this will not find any rag ID, right? But the solution is pretty much the same. Translate this pod IP address to the underlying the cluster node IP address, that of node B, right, with the help of the Kubernetes API server, and then map that to rag ID. We get a matching rag ID, okay? And finally, if your data set is quite small compared with the entire cluster size, your partitions will exist only on a subset of cluster nodes, right? In that case, you want to launch your executors on those cluster nodes. Here, as an extreme example, we have both file A and B on node A, and node B has nothing for us, right? So we want both executor 1 and 2 launch on node A, right? But in Spark on Kubernetes, given that's new code, we didn't have the source code that expressed this preference to Kubernetes. But Kubernetes itself has this node affinity API, so we just added a code. Right? With that code, the driver will say, hey, Kubernetes, I like node A much more for my executors, and both executors will launch here, and we get node locality. But this is just a soft requirement. If node A doesn't have enough resources or something, then executors could still go to other cluster nodes. We're just trying to increase the chance of the getting data locality, okay? All right, so we fixed data locality. Does it make a difference? Let's take a look at an experiment briefly. So here we ran the same Spark job twice. First, without the data locality fix. Second time, with the data locality fix. The job was Terra validate, which reads the output of Terra sort and checks if all records are properly sorted, okay? And the two runs were using the same data of size 500 gigabytes. And looking at the duration, it's very clear the second one finished much earlier, 10 minutes versus 25 minutes. And it got faster because it increased the local disk reads a lot, this blue line, while avoiding the slow network read. This is clearly thanks to the data locality fix. So it made a difference. It made the same job run much faster. Okay. So that's data locality. Now let's talk about secure HDFS. So the plain HDFS is very unsafe because intruders can easily write a custom client code and put false username like your name 
the raw IPC request and steal your data or even destroy your data. So HDFS in production clusters often uses Kerberos to protect the data. And Spark should interact with this secure HDFS in the right way to access the data. First, a human user will get a Kerberos ticket like I did in the demo, right? And then the Spark client will get something called an HDFS token and send it over to the driver and executors, right? And tokens expire over time. So if your job runs for days or weeks, someone should extend the lifetime of your token, okay? So this is an important feature that was missing initially in Spark on Kubernetes, and we have recently added the support. Let's talk about them. But first, how does Kerberos actually work? Here is the basic setup. So user A is sitting here, ready to type in his password, okay? He wants to talk to HTTPS name node over here, which is configured with his own password uh, stored in a file. So in Kerberos, each and every service should have its own account and prove its identity because users want to avoid sending sensitive information like social security number to phishing servers, right? So both user A and HTTPS have registered their accounts and passwords in the Kerberos server. Now, user A signs on with Kerberos saying, hey, I'm user A, may I talk to HTTPS? And the Kerberos server will issue a session key, SK1, as a random unique number. The session key will be later used by user A and HTTPS to encrypt the conversation between them, okay? And here, Kerberos is basically saying, hey, HTTPS, you want to avoid imposters, right? Hey, user A, you want to avoid phishing servers? Then you guys should really talk to each other only if the other side has this session key. I'll get this session key to each of you secretly while checking your ID, and I guarantee that the other side will be genuine if they know this session key. That sounds good, sure, but how can you actually do that? First, it creates two copies of the same session key and put them in these nested messages. Here we have two messages. The purple inner message has a copy of the session key and is encrypted with the password of the HTTPS account so that only the HTTPS name node can decrypt it, okay? And the green outer message has the other copy and is encrypted with user A's password so that only user A can decrypt it, okay? So this is like having two copies of the same receipt, merchant copy and customer copy, and put them in these uh, two safes. So put the merchant copy in the smaller safe and lock it, right? and put the customer copy in the larger safe and lock it too. And then send the whole thing to user A, okay? Then user A will type in the password, decrypt the outer message, and take out the session key. And he will send the remaining inner message to HDFS, which will decrypt it using his password, and take out the session key. Now both sides know the session key, so they can further encrypt the conversation between them using this session key. And to review, in the process of extracting this session key, which is like opening these saves, right, both sides have demonstrated that they know the correct password, which is a strong indication that they are who they claim to be, right? And that's the only way to get their hands on this session key. So by the time they are here, you know, seeing the other side has a session key, they can trust, okay, the other side is genuine, right? So that's how Kerberos works. And the inner message to service is called ticket because having this represents a permission for the user to enjoy the service during the session time, okay? So Kerberos tickets are great, right? They can solve the basic authentication problem, but it turned out they are not sufficient for big data applications. So Kerberos developers were worried about stolen tickets. What if somebody steals a ticket? So they have added a safety measure. Each ticket is stamped with the client IP address from which the user has signed on, so that it cannot be taken to different cluster hosts and then used there. But if you run a Spark job, you would launch the driver and executors across many different cluster nodes, right? So you're hoping to send the ticket to those cluster nodes and use there. 
That's not possible. Bummer. So Hadoop de developers came up with their own invention called delegation tokens to overcome this limitation. So a token is issued by name node only if the client has a valid Kerberos ticket so that you can build on top of the strong Kerberos authentication. You don't want to lose this. But tokens do not have the client IP address stamped anymore. Right? So they can be taken to all cluster nodes and used there. So it's a permit for the driver and executors to use HTTPS on behalf of the human user. <coughs> That's cool. But someone should send the token to the driver and executor. Right? And this part was missing in Spark on Kubernetes. So in Yarn, the Spark client will simply send the token to the Yarn resource manager daemon, which will take care of the rest. Right? So it will forward the token to the node manager daemons that will place the token inside the working directory of the driver and executors. But clearly, we don't have those Yarn daemons in Kubernetes. Right? But instead, we have this Kubernetes secret. Right? They can mount sensitive credentials as volumes on your pod. So we just added a code to the, in the Spark client to use the Kubernetes secret. So here's how it works. First, a human user will get a Kerberos ticket, and then client will talk to the name node and get a HTTPS token, and then it will create a Kubernetes secret and place the token in the secret. And the driver and executor pod will launch. They will mount this secret as a volume, and then just read the token. This is how it works. And this is what was happening back in the demo. OK? But a token expires after 24 hours, or some configured time interval. You can renew it multiple times until seven days max. But after that, you need to get a brand new token. All right? And in Yarn, this is, again, supposed to be done by the Yarn resource manager daemon. But we don't have Yarn daemon, again. But Kubernetes is good at running microservices. So we just wrote a simple microservice for refreshing tokens. So this refresh server runs in its own pod. And it can be used for multiple Spark jobs, not tied to a single job, right? So when a token is about to expire, this refresh server will simply get a new valid Kerberos ticket. And for this, it will use its own system user Kerberos account that can be different from job user account, right? Because it needs to serve multiple jobs, right? Then this refresh server will talk to the name node and get a new token. But this token should belong to the job user account because the driver and executors will use this to access job user data. Something's odd, right? So this refresh server will get a job user token while using its own right, uh, Kerberos account. That's actually possible. That's one of the things that the uh, Hadoop developers invented. So this name node can be configured to recognize this special right, Kerberos account as a proxy for getting job user tokens. OK? And Kubernetes secrets uh, support updating. So this refresh server will just replace token in the secret, right? And then the driver and executor will detect this change and read the token again. Cool. And finally, what if someone tries to steal your token? It kind of removed an important safety measure from token, right? It does not have the client IP address stamped anymore. So it's critical to keep the tokens in the right hands. Fortunately, Kubernetes supports this role-based access control RBAC that determines who has access to which resources. So the cluster admin can set up RBAC rules to deny unauthorized access to your Kubernetes secrets. So if wrong user or wrong pod tries to reach out right, and you know, steal your secret, then they will get an access error. And this RBAC setup can be done as a one-time operation by cluster admin. As a job user, normally you don't need to do anything special. <coughs> All right? So 
that's actually all I have. So in summary, we made HDFS data locality work, and we now support secure HDFS. And we're looking forward to next challenges, like having a performance parity with Yarn, or supporting this uh, name node high availability. Okay. Thanks. And all of this is open source. So if you're interested, join us. Thank you very much, everyone. So we have uh, five minutes for questions. If you have any questions, uh, if you wouldn't mind just stepping up to the microphone or yelling really loudly, but preferably the microphone. Right up here. Can you, I, you had a question mark on performance, but can you speak to how bad the performance is right now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, actually. It's, uh, it's not an easy thing to compare performance across the totally different uh, you know, platforms, right? And we have a hunch that uh, probably this data locality work addresses most of the performance issues. But even in the data locality, there is a minor uh, you know, optimizations that's possible in Yarn, right? For like a node locality, they have something called uh, short circuiting, right? It's a way to let the executor directly access uh, the local disk files as opposed to, you know, sending uh, back and forth data using this, uh, you know, the, the loopback TCP connection, right? So that's uh, architecturally very difficult, right, to implement in Kubernetes, so we're expecting to find those little things, right, uh, going forward. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. Sorry, I just had a question on the data locality. Um, wouldn't it be also possible to solve it uh, by putting the HDFS container and the mm -hmm. Spark executor into the same pod? That's actually possible, but uh, we want to uh, make this HDFS service right, available to multiple Spark jobs, right? So imagine there are like 100 different Spark jobs using all different paths, right? So placing these HDFS daemons inside a single, right, single jobs pod would not work well. Does it answer your question? Maybe you can talk about that. I think what you're saying is you want the HDFS to outlive the Spark cluster. Is oh, that what you're course, saying? Yeah. We want, to, we want uh -huh. the HDFS to outlive, and we want to uh, have a single HDFS instance right, shared by multiple Spark jobs. I see. Yeah. Uh, can you just simply uh, explain a little bit about the, the Spark usage if it's using the S3 storage in this case. So instead of using HTFS, what's the usage or is it possible to move on to the S3 storage? Oh yeah, by, okay. Uh, sorry, so, uh, I have another question. Right, 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 that's a good uh, question. So uh, remember this uh, Spark on Kubernetes is a joint project across uh, multiple companies. So each company actually has a different usage. So some of those companies uh, run Kubernetes entirely in cloud, right? Like AWS EC2 or you know, the Google Cloud, right? So they're, uh, uh, they're relying on S3 as a source of authority in terms of the you know, data, right? And they could use HDFS as well, but sometimes they just don't care because a lot of times a single Spark job has many different stages, right? You have like tens of you know, transformations and there's shuffling between those transformations and so on. And this uh, HDFS performance actually only affects the very first right, uh, transformation that reads data off from HDFS. So it will be slower if you don't use HDFS. Right? S3 is known to be slower by like six times or something. But you know, again, they just think, OK, OK, you know, who cares? Right? It's like uh, 10 minutes out of a six hour one time. All right, thank you. Uh, the other question may be just simple because I only know a little bit about Spark. We have two keeper to, oh no, Hive service to work with Spark. Yeah. Uh, what's the position of Hive service in this case? So we don't yeah, currently you. support Hive, right? Uh, it's a, Hive is a beast, right? There's, there's a, a different, actually, backend of Hive, like Hive over, you know, uh, Taz versus Hive over you know, the Spark or Hive over MapReduce and so on. So we don't support Hive yet uh, in Spark on Kubernetes. 
but who knows, in the future, we may support high. If it's an open source project. If there's a, you know, more demand, then we'll certainly consider it. OK, um, if there are any questions, we're, we're out of time, but I'm, I'm sure that Simon would love to take questions. Yeah, uh, if, you can also come to our booth you know, if you don't, yeah, if you have to go to next you know, talk, yeah. but uh, you want to find me later. Yeah. Okay. Is Peter uh, Balaban here? Thank you very much. Thank you.